think you recorded it. Did you? Yeah, I, I think you. I watched you to to turn off the recording. Oh, well, the I, I recorded about half of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, okay, so um, uh, we don't have too many people here yet, um, but I, th I think I will go ahead and say a few things because I am going to go ahead and post um, um, these help sessions as well, although I missed most of the first help session, unfortunately. Um, but um, at this point, um, as I said in kind of some announcements, um, I do expect everybody should have their dev box up basically at least the, the basic part of it working um, should be past that point. So I'm assuming that except for the one or two people that um, emailed me um, and that were trying to resolve their issue for, that everybody else is ready to, to do work on their dev box. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I was gonna talk about the second, um, the, uh, sorry, about the, uh, the assignments. So the first problem set and the first program assignment here. Um, but um, I thought I would show kind of the, the next step. So, so there are videos. Um, so if you're watching this later on, um, if you go to the, uh, the, the content for our course and look under additional resources, um, I've got links to a YouTube playlist. I think I showed this yesterday, but yeah, again, uh, I probably didn't get this in my recording yesterday. Um, so these are kind of the, the, the links that I have on there are the, um, the regular sort of lectures for the class. So you can watch those at your convenience, um, starting with um, uh, the U01 lectures are the ones for this week, basically. So from the chapter one and chapter two of our textbook here. So um, I'm, I'm, like I was starting to say, I'm expecting everybody to be past kind of this first video so that you've got your class dev box set up, whether you're on Windows or Mac OS, except for the one or two people. So I thought, you know, um, maybe I'll show a few things about uh, actually using the, the dev box, your VS Code server, uh, as well as talk about this hypothetical machine for the, uh, the first problems. And actually we're using the hypothetical machine both for the first problem set and for the first um, program assignment. So um, eventually I'll have a second link. As soon as, soon as I get this video done, um, I'm gonna create another um, YouTube playlist for our summer two um, hackathon help session. So I'll put all of these videos um, on the separate playlist. So, so you'll have that link here as well. Um, All right, so I thought, and, and I, I was talking to the, the one student that was here, so um, um, he is kind of ready to look at um, some of this miscellaneous stuff. So the, the previous announcement that I gave yesterday, there are a few issues, unfortunately, that we found out, uh, two in particular that you need to be aware of and, and uh, uh, fix. So once you get, you're able to get into your dev box, um, you'll have to fix these. Uh, let me repeat one or two things uh, real quickly. So um, if you've got, once you've got your dev box uh, installed, um, uh, you need to, from your host machine, you need to change into your repository directory. So you need to change into your CSCI 430 OS sims directory. Uh, and then the, the two commands that you're normally going to be using are vagrant halt. Um, so whenever you're done using your dev box, go back to your host machine to the command line and use the vagrant halt to shut it down. Um, and then whenever you want to start up your dev box, do a, a vagrant up again. All right. So um, that's the, the normal way to boot these virtual machines. Don't, don't use the virtual box GUI. Use, use vagrant from the command line to bring it down uh, cleanly and to boot it back up. Um, when you're ready to work again with your dev box, okay? And some things that we mentioned, you know, so it's good to, to be aware of this, understand some of these messages that you're seeing. So always look out, make certain that you are getting your ports being forwarded, in particular that you're getting the 8080 port being forwarded. That's the port that Visual Studio Code server runs on. So that port needs to be forwarded so you can access Visual Studio Code. Also, it's important that you get the, um, the, the shared folders to be mounted here. 
And I'm going to show why here in a second, but you want to look for this message that it's mounting your shared folders. If you see those, and if you see that eight, port 8080 is being forwarded, you should be able to bring up a regular web browser and just to open up the URL HTTP um, colon slash slash 127.0.0.1 colon 8080. Okay, so 127.0.0.1 is the IP address of your home, of your local machine, of, of, of the machine that you installed the stuff on. Uh, and then colon 8080, that's the port number. So we're, instead of accessing the normal HTTP port number, we're accessing port 8080. That should be where your Visual Studio Code server is being served up at, all right? So if you, if you see, you should see your Visual Studio Code come up for you. It'll look something like this and you'll have these. Uh, actually, when you first do it, um, it'll be with the default color theme. So it'll look more like this when you first bring it up. So, um, all right, so like I'm saying, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody's pretty much past that point, um, uh, are able to bring up the Visual Studio Code. Now, um, you need to install one extension by hand. Unfortunately, we couldn't install this for you, but also uh, doubly, unfortunately, uh, it turns out the one that I had downloaded and put into the dev box um, was uh, an, uh, an older version. So what happens is it detects that it's the not it's not the most recent version, and it tries to reinstall the, the newest version, 1.5.1. But for some reason, I think there's a bug in Visual Studio Code Server. It installs the version not for Linux but for something else, um, and then it stops working at that point. So what you need to do. Um, so if you click on this, you can download um, this file. Now this is going to download the, the file CPP tools linux.vsix. VSIX is the extension for um, the Visual Studio extensions um, that you can add into the uh, IDE, right? So if you save this file, it's going to save it um, on your host system, right? So for me, uh, if I could bring up a file browser, that's going to download it to my downloads directory. So I'll have a CPP tools.vsix um, download once it finishes downloading here. Uh, there, I guess it's finished. So uh, about 24 megabytes. So you need to get that file onto your uh, dev box machine. So this is where the uh, the shared folders comes in. Okay, so um, um, I okay, I, I installed my dev box in a subdirectory called boxes. So, so you'll have your dev box in a, in a subdirectory called repos if you follow my instruction. So you should, if you go to repos and then the, the CSCI 430 OS Sims, you should see all your files. Okay. And then um, if you copy anything to this directory, this folder is being shared between your host system and your dev box, the, the guest system, okay? So if you copy a file to this directory, you'll be able to access it in your guest system, uh, in your dev box, all right? So uh, for me, and um, I have to actually do it, I'm running my dev box from, from my boxes subdirectory. So I'm gonna copy it over here to show you the effect here. So if I take this file and if I drag it over there or however you normally copy files from one place to another. So now I've got it. Um, in my repos directory for my running dev box here, the CPP tools Linux.vsix, right? Um, so if, if you open up your Visual Studio Code server then, um, and I'm gonna uninstall, so I've got 1.5.1 installed here. So that's kind of what you wanna try to get it. So you have 1.5.1 installed. Um, so what you normally do, if you don't have anything, if you do have something installed, go ahead and uninstall it. Um, and then you need to, you know, click on the, the more, the three dots up here to get more options and then install, install from the VSIX file. And so what you should see is what the, the, the file that I had originally for you is in your home vagrant directory. Okay. So you don't want to use that file. The file that you just copied or that I just copied should end up being in your sync directory, okay? So in fact, I probably should have told you um, um, it might have been a good idea for me to, 
just to be 100% certain, I'm going to go ahead and like delete those. Okay, so I'm going to delete this out of here, um, out of my shared folder. And um, I'm going to open up a terminal here. So if you go to terminal, new terminal, um, I'm running a terminal in my dev box here. Um, I'm running a terminal in my dev box here, um, and I'm currently in Home Vagrant. If you do an LS there, you'll see. So this is this is the one that you don't want to install. This is the one that I'd originally given you, uh, this, the one called CPP Tools Linux.bsix. I'm just going to remove those using the rm command. Okay. So now, and, and now if you look in your sync directory, um, you shouldn't see that file. Well, I, I shouldn't because I deleted it. So I'm going to recopy it again, just to make certain that I am going to be installing the version 1.5.1 here. So let me, let me do that copy again. So I'll copy it from where I downloaded it. Um, I guess I'm going to have to re-download it. I shouldn't have deleted that. Um, so let's so re-download that. I'll wait for it to download here this time. Again, I'm just running this browser on my normal system. So this is this is going to my host system. So this will be your laptop or your desktop. And it should download to where you normally download files to. All right. So the trick then of using your shared folder to get files back and forth between your host system and your guest dev box. Um, is, is you just need to copy of them to that shared folder. Okay, so we're done with the download now. Um, so I'm gonna control C, copy that, and then go over. So for me, it's it's in my home directory boxes, CSCI 430 OSM. So for you, it'll probably be your home directory um, repos, CSCI 430 OSMs, if you followed my directions. So if you copy the, the file there, uh, then if you go back into your dev box, and you look in the sync directory, so that folder, your CSCI uh, 430 OS Sims is synced with the file, with, with the directory called sync in your dev box. So now you should see um, that file in, in your sync. All right. Sorry, I just because. Go ahead. Yeah. If yesterday when I did that on my machine, I had to refresh it to show, let it show up. Right. So if you don't see it refresh. Right. So so usually working from the terminal, it should refresh automatically. But if you're trying to do from the browser, like like browsing files in Visual Studio Code, uh, it, it's uh, you can always refresh. Sometimes you do have to refresh things to get Visual Studio Code to um refer to update basically. So you can just reload your tab like you normally would um, in your web browser to do that. So. All right, so then back to installing this. Um, so, so this is the extensions. Um, you know, if, if you're from a, a clean install here, you probably don't have anything installed yet. Uh, you shouldn't install from, uh, you know, from the from what it suggests, because again, I think it usually installs the wrong version. It installs like a Windows version instead of the Linux version for some reason. Again, I think it's a bug. So, so you need to install, you need to download that BSIX file by hand and install it. So go to the more options, install from BSIX. So this, this is a file browser inside, this is Visual Studio Code's file browser. So from here, you have to browse to the sync subdirectory um, and find your file and select it to install from it. And again, you know, just, just so there's a couple ways. If, if you don't have this right, um, you'll get messages that um, the IntelliSense isn't working um, and um, some other things. Um, uh, here's another place. So once it's installed, uh, you might want to do a refresh to, to be 100% certain that it has it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you see version 1.5.1, uh, here, you're probably good, All 
Okay. So we'll come back to that. I'll show you some, some things to look out for um, if you don't have the, the right CPP IntelliSense, C++ IntelliSense installed, uh, some other the things are kind of going wrong here. Um, but the, the, yeah, so the other issue then, uh, also um, there's, um, this should only be a problem for Windows users, but you can check it whether you're a Windows or Mac user. Um, so first of all, th this is beginning, th this is the start of how you actually work with the assignments for this class. So you should always be able to do the build system by hand from a terminal um, um, in your dev box. So it's good to, to check these out, make certain that your build system is working. Um, so let me show doing that. Um, so the first thing you should do, uh, whenever you're working on the assignments for this class, always open up the particular, the, the particular um, assignment subdirectory. So what I mean by that, so if, if you go over to here, this is, this is the kind of the, the, the menu, the general menu here. Um, and what you want to do is you want to do a file uh, open folder. So you always be working from an open folder for your assignments for this class. Um, and then in particular, though, um, you want to open up the uh, home vagrant sync assignment and then the particular assignment that you're working on. So you, we've got all five, you should have all five assignments already. Uh, in your dev box downloaded and ready to use. Um, but uh, like this week for our first unit, we're working on assignment one. So what you would do is select assignment one and say, okay, to open up that folder to work on that assignment, right? Um, so normally you won't have files open because again, I've been using this dev box before. So normally when you first open up your folder, um, it'll open up, but um, you won't have any files open here. Um, and on your left-hand side in the uh, Explorer, um, you'll have an outline, which will probably be at the bottom, and you'll have the, um, the file browser here, right, which is the, the files in assignment one, okay? Um, so, for example, I can open up, let's say, the assignment one tests file here that we'll talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, back to the build. So it's, it's good to check that you can build this by hand, first of all, make certain that the build system is, is correctly set up. It should be because it, it doesn't depend on Visual Studio Code. It, it's, it's installed as part of the dev box. But if, if you go and open a terminal here, you can try and do the build system by hand. So uh, again, if you do uh, open up the, the menu and say terminal, new terminal, that opens up a terminal here. Um, the keyboard shortcut for that is um, what? Um, control shift um, single back tick. So I guess that's control tilde, control shift back tick. So, oh, except for, yeah, some, sometimes, um, sometimes the keyboard shortcuts might be um, overridden by your browser, which is a little bit of an of annoyance of an issue. So control shift. Uh, back tick is actually for Firefox uh, might do something else. So, so yeah, you might have to use the, the menu to access these sometimes. So anyway, um, get a terminal. So notice that it, it opens up in the assignment one directory. Okay, so, so we're currently in the assignment one directory, which is where you need to be to build um, to, to, to build the assignments. Okay. And then to build these by hand, so there, there's we use a tool called Make to um, to, to manage and build um, our projects here within the, the the dev box. So if you do a Make Help, you can get a list of all of the uh, commands, um, all the valid targets uh, that you can do for a Make that you can do with Make here. Um, so Make Test, Make Sim, so on. So the three normal ones that you use for building um, the, the assignments that when you're working on them is you might want to start with a make clean just to make certain that you're building from a clean state, right? So that should just do an RM command to remove um, any sort of um, temporary or build product files like object files and things. And then if you do a make all, um, 
or the default is to do make all. So you don't have to specify a target. If you don't specify any target, it will do a make all by default. So these are equivalent, make or just make all or just make. That should actually build your project. So it'll, it'll compile all the files into object files um, and then link them into um, a test executable and um, a sim executable, right? So for all the assignments for this class, we're ultimately building a simulation. So like this first week, we're building our hypothetical machine simulator. Um, yeah. Um, and then finally, so, so the, 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 the normal workflow is you do a make clean, make all, and then make test to run the, the unit test. So what you're normally going to be doing for these assignments is, is writing code and then doing a make and then a make test uh, and then checking to, to try and get all these tests to pass that we've given for you, right? So, so I'll, I'll come back and show that in a second here. So I first want to get through these issues, right? So uh, again, just to summarize on that, so make certain that you can do a make clean, make or make all, and then um, make tests, right? The very first time that you do a make all, um, it might take quite a bit longer than it just took there because it, it builds some additional things, but it usually only does that the very first time you do a make um, ever in your dev box. So, so even for assignment two, um, so, so I'm just being saying, be patient. So the very first time you do a make, um, it could take you know, 30, 40 seconds or so, um, which is usual. And then make tests. Okay. So um, for the second issue, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove this file So for the second issue, basically on Windows machines, uh, there was a problem copying over this VS Code directory, which contains uh, configuration information basically for the Visual Studio Code server. So um, if this file is missing, or well, it's not missing, but, but if you don't have it, have the right one, this is actually the subdirectory, you'll get this problem. So um, um, you'll get issues that um, um, it can't, you know, you get the squiggle, so it won't be able to find your include files. And if you use the keyboard shortcuts, or if you try to, so um, as, as I talked about uh, in the video, if you've watched these for using your dev box, uh, control shift one should do the make clean, and then control shift two should do the make all, right? And control shift three then should do the make tests, right? So if those aren't working, um, then it means that um, um, you need to do these steps that are talked about um, for the um, to get your .vs code set up, um, the, the configuration set up for Visual Studio Code here. So what you want to do is again, you need to open up. Uh, you have to do this from a terminal in your dev box. Um, open up the terminal and, and first do the rm -f vs code. All right, so that'll just remove the bad one if, if you're on Windows um, and then do this copy. If you want to, you should be able to copy and paste these. So I'll, I'll try that. So if you copy, Control C. Now to paste in here, so Control V probably won't work. Well, it might. If it doesn't work, um, sometimes you need to use Shift Control V or sometimes you can right click um, on your terminal window and do like a um, copy and paste that way. Right. So anyway, um, so you might want to try and find that out so you know how to copy and paste text both into an editor in your Visual Studio Code and into your terminal. So, so anyway, you want to run this, this command is just simply copying. It's actually copying um, the directory called VS Code from two directories up to my assignment one directory here. Okay? So if you're, if you're trying to type this in by hand, I mean, space and punctuation matter. So there's like a dash R, and there's a space, and then there's two dots. 
back, uh, backslash two dots backslash, and there's a, a dot VS code, and there's a space in between here, and then a dot VS code. So these are just the names of the files. Um, but yeah, as soon as you do that, I mean, it should get rid of the problem about the um, includes. And you should be able to use the keyboard shortcuts now, and plus all the other configurations should be correct, hopefully. Although again, you know, it'd be safe. You might want to um, um, reload, refresh your VS code. So once you once you do that, you should be able to use again. You can always build by hand from a terminal, but you should be able to use Control Shift One. Um, so notice, I mean, all the control shift one, it's, it's, it's a keyboard binding, um, but it's bound to run the command make clean from a terminal, basically. So, so it's just a, a keyboard shortcut to run the make clean. And control shift two then should be bound to run make all for you um, in a terminal. And then control shift three then should run your tests. Um, all right, so I only had one student uh, show up, but uh, any question about that so far? I think that, um, so those are the things, I mean, once you have your dev box up, um, um, you will have to get past those two issues. Or uh, again, if you're a Mac user, probably this one, the second one shouldn't be a problem for you um, because Mac, Mac sets up those, that VS Code directory. Um, fine. Um, it's just Windows that has this problem, I think. Um, but you will have to get this extension installed. If that extension isn't installed, um, So if I, if I disable that or uninstall it, um, normally what you get is, um, you should still be able to build, um, but uh, you won't get, you won't get, for example, you won't get the automatic um, linking of, um, if you have build problems, you won't get those showing up in the problems here. So you can click on them and directly go to the problem. Um, and you won't get the the highlighting of the build of, of potential build issues um, if you don't have the IntelliSense correctly installed uh, as well. So. All right. So, um, yeah, so I, I was planning on maybe talking a little bit about the, um, the, the first written problem set and then this first assignment a little bit. Um, and um, I'm not going to talk about them too long. Let's, maybe maybe it'd be best to talk about uh, the written problem set first. Uh, because they're both related. So for both of these, we're working on um, our hypothetical machine. So, you know, if uh, you need to watch the, the videos. Um, so I talk about the hypothetical machine in the U01-1 video, um, plus you need to read chapter one. So, so the, the hypothetical machine is introduced in chapter one of our textbook. Um, So for this first problem set, um, I gave you um, 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 a regular Word, Microsoft Word document, plus an open, um, open office, uh, what's it called, the uh, ODP file. Um, that's just another office suite or a PDF. So probably the easiest thing to do is if, if, you, if you have the ability to, to edit Word documents, um, uh, LibreOffice is the open office uh, thing. Um, 
But if you have the ability to edit um, Word documents, um, just to directly put your answers um, into that and save that, and then upload that to uh, the, the submission folder for my Leo online, okay? So um, for both the, the first program assignment and this first problem set, we're working with this hypothetical machine. So this is just a, um, a um, um, definition of a machine architecture, just to get some practice and, and to make certain that um, you know, we're all on the same page so that you guys um, kind of know the expected sort of names of things and vocabulary um, and uh, have a basic understanding of how computers work at like the machine architecture level, basically, okay? So we've, we've got defined on our hypothetical machine um, an instruction format. So this is actually a 16-bit uh, memory architecture. So all of the, the instructions are 16 bits and all of the words in memory are 16 bits as well. So all the data and all the instructions fit in one 16-bit word in our hypothetical machine. For the instructions, the first four bits um, define the operation or the opcode. So um, uh, the example from our textbook had three opcodes, load, store, and add. So th this is binary. So binary 0001 is, is one uh, in decimal or one in hexadecimal, right? Uh, so, um, and binary 0010 would be a two in decimal or hexadecimal. And this is a, um, uh, this is a five, right? So, so, so uh, four plus one here. Um, so yeah, so if, if um, you need to, if you need to review binary to decimal to hexadecimal um, conversion of base systems, you might want to go back and do that. I expect people to kind of uh, know the basics of that um, before taking this course. Um, for this assignment, I added in a few um, additional opcodes. So besides the load, store, and add, um, I threw in a subtract which is um, um, uh, uh, binary, or which is um, hexadecimal four, a digit of four, right? Uh, so five is still add, and then we added in a couple of jump instructions. So a, um, a six is an absolute jump, a seven is a, a jump on zero, um, and an eight is a jump on negative result, right? So, um, so the first thing to understand is that all of these values are actually hexadecimal values here, right? So again, if you know your hexadecimal to binary conversion, each hexadecimal digit represents four binary bits, right? So the first digit of each of these, uh, if we're going to interpret it as an instruction for a typical fetch execute cycle, the first digit represents the first four bits, according to our machine, uh, hypothetical machine instruction format, right? So those first four bits then tell you what the instruction is, right? So if you see a four, that's the instruction four, um, subtract, and so on, right? So, I mean, first thing you have to do is kind of decode these, in these um, instructions, right? The first four bits are the instruction, and then the last 12 bits represent a memory address, right? So this is, this is our addressing mechanism for our hypothetical machine here. Um, so the basics, I mean, you know, again, you know, you need to watch the videos and, 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 and have gone through the materials. Um, you know, read the read the, um, the the textbook for this unit, so I expect you to understand how a basic fetch execute cycle works in order to fill out right. So the basic fetch cycle is all you do for the fetch part of the fetch execute cycle is you look at the program counter. That's a memory address, and whatever the the program counter is pointing to, which is memory address three hundred, that is going to be fetched to the instruction register. 
So, so the, the next instruction, which is 4940, gets fetched to the instruction register, right? And then when you go to the execute stage, so normally two things happen. The, the program counter gets incremented. So normally, unless you're doing some kind of a jump, um, the, the program counter normally increments by one each time uh, in order to execute the next instruction sequentially. That's the basics of a machine architecture like this. How, how machines are, are um, executed is sequentially, normally, unless we have branch or jump instructions that change the program counter. Um, so then, yeah, so you have to decode whatever instruction is and execute it. Uh, and then, so you might end up fill it, you might end up having to modify the accumulator, the program counter, um, um, and like if it's a store instruction, um, it might end up storing something from the accumulator to like memory, normally like 940 or 941. All right. So, um, so, um, some notes about that when you're doing the, the first written assignment. So when you're executing these instructions, I normally only gave three instructions. So it could be the, the it could be possible that you fetch execute instruction one from 300, fetch, fetch execute instruction two from memory 301, fetch execute instruction three from memory 302. And at that point, your program counter would be 303, but you don't have an instruction for 303. So if you ever get to an uh, the program counter for an instruction that you don't have, that means you're done, right? So in some cases, you only end up filling in like the first six cells, right? Um, but it's also possible, like if you have a jump instruction that you could execute like forever, you might have an infinite loop. So in that case, you only have to fill in the, the first eight, right? As soon as you fill in all eight of these cells, you're done if, if you're in a loop um, or some other situation like that. Um, so all of the values in memory are actually 16 bit. So you should always be rec you should always be writing your answers as um, hexadecimal values in memory here. So as 16 bit, four digit hexadecimal uh, representations. Right? And also make certain that you get the representation of negative numbers correct. Okay, so there will be some results where you end up with a negative number. So we don't use anything fancy in our uh, definition of, um, of, of, of negative. Uh, a re so our represent representation of negative numbers is nothing fancy. We're not using one's complement or two's complement. We use a simple sign bit. Um, from the representation given for our hypothetical machine for our textbook. So that just means that if the number is positive, uh, we only use 15 bits to represent the magnitude of any integer. And if it's positive, the, the most significant bit will just be a zero. But if it's negative, the most significant bit will be a one. Right? Um, and then, as I say here, so you should think about this, but um, hopefully if people read this carefully. I don't know if everybody will read this or watch this video, but the correct way to represent negative one, I always get people that want to represent negative one as a one, zero, zero, one, right? But one, zero, zero, one in binary is zero, 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 one, and then zeros with, with a one at the least significant digit. But so that's not correct, right? So, so the, the, the representation of negative one is a one in the most significant digit. So that's one, zero, 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 or hexadecimal um, eight, right? So a negative number um, needs to have a one in the most significant digit to represent that it's negative. All right. Um, any quick questions from the audience here? Remember, you might be asking questions for everybody. So if there's anything that you have on your mind, let me know about the written. There's um, one I have. Sure. Um, I, I'm seeing that you wanted them to do it in hexadecimal values rather than normal decimal. 
Well, these are hexadecimal. Yeah, they should. I mean, yeah, if, if so, if they get a result like of 10 and they write it at 10 instead of using hexadecimal notation, that's incorrect. So minus some points. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that. And there are a couple where the result is more than 10 or, or less than negative 10 or something. So, so yeah. Um, all right. So um, then I'm, I'm going to have to kind of, I'm going to go quickly. I'm going to talk real quickly then about the assignment, uh, about the, the, the program assignment workflow a little bit more. Um, So, um, so for one thing, if you look in your file, um, like the assignment one, uh, there is a .md file. This is a markdown file. This, this has the full description of the assignment. Um, you, can, you can read that. Um, and if you want to, you can even render this. So markdown files are like, it's a, a markup language like HTML. So I think you can like right click, um, or maybe right click on the tab yeah, and like open preview or do a control shift V. So this will give you a rendered version of, of the markdown, right? There is also a PDF file, although um, Visual Studio Code doesn't know how to, to display PDF files in Visual Studio Code. And as far as I can tell, there's no good browser. Uh, there, there's no good extension for viewing PDFs. But if you want to, again, if you go back to your host system um, and if you browse to you know, the, the assignment, assignment one, if you have a PDF reader on your host system, you should be able to, to open up that PDF file. Um, on your host system and read it there if that's more readable for you. Um, um, So for assignment one, we're building a simulator. So, so all of the assignments for the class, we build simulations of different pieces of the operating system. So a memory manager, um, a process scheduler, a round robin, uh, process management, and, and some other things. So this week, um, um, this unit, we're um, building that hypothetical machine. OK, so. Um, um, So what you normally do, so I'm just going to jump right to kind of showing you how to get started on this. Um, so what we've given you for these simulators, these simulations, is um, I've given you a bunch of code already. Normally, what you have to do is implement um, a few functions that are missing that, that, that we didn't give you in the full simulation. And then um, later on, there'll be additional things that you have to do. So normally what you'll do is you'll go down and find the unit test tasks and start with task one um, for these. So the, the, the first task um, for uh, the assignment one is we need to implement the initialized memory here. So, um, right. So, um, So for assignment one, you're mostly going to be adding code into the hypothetical machine simulator.cpp. That's where the initialized memory is, right? So if you look at hypothetical machine simulator.hpp, uh, the hypothetical machine simulator is a C++ class. Um, so all of our um, projects, all of our assignments in this class are object oriented for the most part. Um, so most of the simulators have a single class that, that defines the simulation. Um, so this simulator basically has, for example, a function called load program, which can load dot sim files like program one sim. Okay, and these are basically the same as the hypothetical machine that you're going to do by hand. So this defines uh, at before the simulation starts. This defines the the initial value of the program counter, the initial value of the accumulator. And then it defines memory. So this is the 
a range of valid memory from a base address of 300 to a, a bounds address of 1,000. And then this is the actual contents of memory. So at memory address 300, we have the value 1940, which is a, a load instruction, if I remember right. So, uh, you know, one is like a load um, and so on. Um, so let's, um, let's just look at initialized memory. So normally when, when you do, uh, when, it, when, when I give you these assignments, they should all be building um, and running uh, before you do anything. So you should be able to always do a make clean, a make all, and it, it will build successfully. And you should be able to run the tests. So when you, when you do the, the control shift three or the make tests, you notice it's actually running the test starting here in the assignment one test.cpp file, right? Uh, but, but these tests will be failing. So, so your task for, for the, 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 um, the unit test task are to implement these functions and so you can get these tests to pass, all right? Um, so I'll just give you, so basically the purpose of initialized memory is, you know, when, when the simulator gets to the point where it needs to um, load up this um, initial state of memory, it calls initialized memory to create a, a simulated memory with a base address of 300 and a bounds address of 1,000, right? So, so we have to initialize memory um, um, and the initialized memory for a uh, hypothetical machine simulator um, takes two parameters, the base address and the bounds address. So um, here's kind of a hint. I, I like using the outline in um, Visual Studio Code because um, um, as normally it'll give you kind of an outline of all the functions. I don't know why I'm not getting an outline here. Do I have to rebuild? Huh, I'll have to check that. That's too bad. So I use that a lot on Visual Studio Code. Um, anyway, so um, let's go find the initialized memory. So I'll, I'll search for it instead. So, um, so Control F, um, you can do a basic search in Visual Studio Code. Um, so, I mean, this is just using it. So you have to, we have to find where it's actually uh, being implemented. Um, so here's, here's the actual implementation of it, right? So basically, um, you know, just to cut to the chase, to get these tests to pass, uh, we have to write some code. And so I often also have some comments on here and some things that you need to do. So for example, for the hypothetical machine, um, it's got some member variables, the member base address, the member memory bounds address. So kind of the first thing that you need to do is, um, is initialize those member variables, right? Um, so we're passed in memory base address and memory bounds address as parameters to initialize memory. And this, um, so since the name of the, the parameter for the class is the same as the name so since the name of the member variable uh, for the class is the same as the parameter name, we can disambiguate this in C++ by using this, which points to memory address. Okay, so, so this one refers to the uh, member variable, and this one refers to the um, parameters passed in. Okay? If that's confusing, I know some, some people don't like that. Uh, I prefer that, but uh, some people just do something like, um, uh, 
give a different name. So if it makes more sense to you, call these the, the initial memory base address and the initial memory bounds address. Um, so either way, but but yeah, if, if there's no if there's no um, if there's no ambiguity. So if if they're not exactly the same names, um, it, it'll know that since I don't have a parameter named memory base address, now I'm referring to the memory address, which is the um, the class variable name here. So. All right. So, um, and I encourage you to always use incremental development. So these programs, these simulations are, are complicated enough that you don't wanna add more than a line or two of code before you recompile and then check your tests, okay? So in particular, if you did everything right for these first two steps, we would expect, assuming that the get memory base address and the get memory bounds address are getting the, and returning the memory base address and the memory bounds address, we would expect these tests to pass. Although I need to go check those. I'm not certain if we, if I gave those to you or if you need to uh, write those as well, but let's compile. Um, you don't always have to do a make clean. Um, um, I sometimes do it more often than I need to, but you should recompile whenever you add a line of code or two um, and then run your tests, okay? And then whenever you're looking at these tests, always look at the first failing test because often tests after that are failing because of tests before that. So really usually the only the first test is gonna be the, the important one for understanding what you need to do next in your code. Right. So um, yeah, apparently you know the, the get memory base address and bounds address are returning because notice we are passing um, the test on line three one line thirty one and line thirty two. The the first one we're failing now is the one on line thirty three. So get the memory size right. So memory size. Um, Um, is just a function of the base and the bounds address, okay? So, you know, if, if, if addresses in our simulation go from 300 to 1,000, that means we have a total memory size of 700, just the difference of those, right? So um, there's another member variable called memory size. So let's set the memory size, recompile, and rerun our tests. And now our first failing one is all the way down to line 66. We're actually getting through um, actually getting through all of these. Um, a little bit surprised. I thought we should have not been getting past this this um, throwing the, the um, capturing. But anyway, so, so that's, that's the basic idea. So. All right. Um, So yeah, for this first assignment, I got you started, um, and I think I already did this also in the uh, video about using your dev box. I might have even gone a little bit further in that video as well on this first function here. So, but yeah, after that, um, I mean, once you get initialized memory working, then you have to, to get the translate address, peek and poke address, um, and then there's basic fetch and execute cycles, or functions that, that implement the fetch and execute cycle in the simulation. Although execute is relatively simple because it just simply does a big switch state statement. Um, and then calls um, a particular function to execute, you know, a load or a store or a jump or a subtract or an add instruction. Um, all right, um, yeah. So I think um, um, that's pretty good for this kind of session here. Uh, do I have any kind of questions anybody wants to ask here?
um, on that. Um, if not, I, I don't know, I'll have to upload this video and post an announcement. Um, so we'll start getting these help session videos on a playlist as well. So any, if anybody is watching this after the fact, um, um, hopefully that's helpful to get you started. But uh, yeah, as usual, you know, um, you can always contact me or Amy by email. Uh, make certain that you get your first written problem set in by today, um, and you should get started working on this assignment. So most students need more than you know a day or a couple hours to work on these, right? So, so you really should get working in seriousness on the assignments by Monday or Tuesday of each of each unit, so, so sometime today. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the session um, and I uh, will see you guys later then. Dr. Harder, can you stay on for a sec? Sure. Stop the recording.